When you walk through a storm, hold your chin up high. Well, that is easier said than done. I don't know about you, but when I walk through a storm, I often feel like hiding my head in a bag. When we walk through a storm, perhaps the storm of losing someone or something we love, perhaps the storm of an unanticipated or frightening health condition, perhaps the storm of job loss or the storm of a child facing difficulties we can't easily correct, perhaps the storm of addiction, perhaps the storm of family strife, we can feel too overwhelmed and too numb to hold up our head. And we might even feel as if we're not worthy of being seen. Perhaps. In 2010, researcher and storyteller Brene Brown released a TED Talk, which became an internet event, and which was watched by several million people. In it, she says that when things happen to people that we didn't expect or which are out of the social norm of what is supposed to happen, we can feel shame. And after six years of research and hundreds of interviews, this is what she found. These are her words. I ran into this unnamed thing that absolutely unraveled connection in a way that I didn't understand or had never seen, and it turned out to be shame. And shame is really easily understood as the fear of disconnection. Is there something about me that if other people knew it or saw it, I wouldn't be worthy of connection? The things I can tell you about, it's universal. We all have it. The only people who don't experience shame have no capacity for human empathy or connection. No one wants to talk about it, she writes, and the less you talk about it, the more you have it, which underpinned this shame, this I'm not good enough, which we all know that feeling. I'm not blank enough, I'm not thin enough, rich enough, beautiful enough, smart enough, promoted enough. The thing that underpinned this was excruciating vulnerability, this idea that in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen, truly seen. Now, Brown gives words to what we know from our own experience. That's probably why so many people watched that particular TED Talk. Shame is that lava flow of emotion that washes over everything, burying it and immobilizing everything in its path. It tells us that what has happened to us is not okay, that who we are is not okay, that even the society we live in and the way it behaves on a larger scale is not okay. Parker Palmer, the author of A Hidden Wholeness, says that at our core, what we human beings want more than anything else is simply to be seen. To be seen in our accomplishments, but also to be seen and still embraced in our imperfections. And yet, so often we do not allow this to happen because, as Brown put it, the thing that keeps us out of connection is the belief that we're not worthy of it. Not worthy because we're imperfect, because mistakes hit us in the eyes daily, because we're so aware of the places that we're not okay and the places that we try to hide. Perhaps because we've been taught that we do not air our dirty linens in public, as it used to be said. Perhaps it's because we once tried to share and experience judgment. <coughs> Perhaps because our own voices of condemnation that sound in our head are louder and strident than any others could be. We keep those imperfect parts of ourselves hidden even though, as Ralph Waldo Emerson said in the 19th century, there is a crack in everything that God has made, which songwriter Leonard Cohen paraphrased in the 20th century as, there's a crack in everything, that's where the light gets in. This weekend, as has been mentioned, as it should be numerous times this morning, across the nation, people have been remembering the March on Selma, which occurred on March 7, 1965, known as Bloody Sunday, because of it was one of the most cracked and broken moments in our nation's history. On that day, civil rights leaders led 600 marchers towards Montgomery in pursuit of voting rights, 
They were stopped after just six blocks. The marchers were beaten, clubbed, sprayed with tear gas by police as they crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge. For those of us who saw Ava DuVernay's movie Selma released last year, you're aware of how vulnerable the people see and how courageous as they set up on that march. Some carrying lunches in their hands, sack lunches or small suitcases. Necks erect with a certain nervous, tense determination. Fifty years ago, the images of that attack were televised across the country and the world, and it horrified citizens and roused support. And Unitarian Universalists were among those flocking to Alabama that weekend as they are this weekend, noting especially the death of the Reverend James Reeb in that aftermath, a young white Unitarian Universalist minister from Washington, D.C., whose death answering the call to witness from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called the attention of the nation to these matters and gave rise to a tide of feeling which led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Reeb's death was one of our most shameful moments and the response of our clergy though, including the Reverend Aaron Gilmartin who served this congregation in those years, is a source of great pride for us. Reverend Dr. Mark Morrison Reed, one of our clergy, has written a new history about Selma and our involvement of our faith in it, and he speaks to the complexity, the cracks in that story, which give lessons to us today. As you use across the nation, struggle to discern how best to engage with and address the growing unrest created by grand jury verdicts and trials of black men and street actions, that happen. We are re-examining our roles and re-examining the truth, the fuller truth, of what happened when we went to Selma is an invaluable historical compass for us and a divining rod. Morrison Reed points out that it's only through our willingness to be vulnerable, only through our willingness to look deeply at those places where our espoused values and our values in practice have that crack between them that we can actually learn and grow. Selma, he says, was the tipping point. That was where we learned that we needed to step forward in a different way. When we face seismic changes in the landscape of our society, we need places to come together and struggle with our truths, just as when we face seismic changes in our own personal lives, we need those places too. Sometimes that can mean cracking open and breaking down our own self-satisfaction, not to leave our moments of highest aspiration shattered, but rather to re-piece the best parts back together again in the spirit of the Kintsugi Japanese pottery tradition, which breaks things open and then cements them back together with lacquer filled with gold. Perhaps in our work, whether it's justice in our own lives or justice in the world, we need places like this to allow us to reflect on what we've done well and the places where we need to create a deeper beauty by breaking things open and mending them back together again. We will do some of this on Tuesday night at our Justice Night. We'll look a little bit more at Morrison Reed's analysis of our role at Selma so that we're better able with that new strength, that new beauty, to meet the challenges of the world around us and the challenges of our own lives. B'nai Brown found an antidote to shame, wholeheartedness. Wholeheartedness, which she says, comes from three kinds of being, from courage, from living a life of compassion, and from connection. It's interesting to me that Courage and compassion are both words that are found in the mission statement that we read together for this church every week. Wholeheartedness, she said, is what is required by people who do things like walk across that Pettus Bridge 50 years ago. It's also what's required of people who do that hard work in those times of storm and simply get out of bed and leave the house or walk into these doors not knowing how vulnerable they are. 
Compassion was the engine that compelled middle-class white people such as Reeb to answer the call to Selma, and it's what calls our folks to stand on the corners in Antioch or march in Oakland, which is now classified as one of the three most violent cities in our nation. Connection is what social movements connect, create when they bring people together to become the miracle of action. And it's what gives this place the courage to offer spaces for people willing to examine those fragments of their own lives that they need to put back in place. Now, Brene Brown found that people who were wholehearted were people who could be vulnerable people and communities that could acknowledge their imperfections and the need for something beyond, what, what author David Rico, who will be with us next Saturday, calls the more. One of the great rewards of my job is that I get to see the ways that the veins of gold are used to pace back together the pieces of lives and create something stronger and more beautiful. Perhaps the pieces are there because of the death of a loved one, perhaps because of the death of a dream of an idealized world that didn't turn out to be. Perhaps the pieces need refitting because of economic uncertainty, which our culture has taught we should not discuss, or maybe because of the uncertainty of aging, which is something we're not necessarily prepared to talk about. Perhaps the golden glue of friendship is needed when someone's life has just slowly been eroded away by a life of caretaking for a loved one. I know for myself in recent years, when I've had to undertake that painstaking work of piecing back together a life, inspiration has come from knowing all that is held here and the bravery of people who, as Brene Brown puts it, <coughs> dare greatly every week, sometimes just by having the courage to walk through these doors. The song that the choir just sang, Community of Love, is a little of that story for me the song was written by a dear friend of David's and mine, and the anniversary of his death is actually tomorrow. Tim sang it at our wedding. And when Mark suggested that it be sung today when I got back from my sabbatical, my first reaction, and I may have actually said this to him, was no. Because I basically think that uh, public snuffling does not enhance one's preaching ability. <laughs> and I can't remember if I actually said no. But I decided to say again, yes, and so I said yes. Because I decided to be wholehearted in the face of that song, which for me is like one of those kintsugi pottery pieces. It's no longer the original glorious whole that it was once for me, before the reality of death and the piercing loss of divorce, and yet now it is more beautiful because it's woven through with the golden veins of continued friendship and collegiality, and it is a testimony to the legacy of love that's made immortal through music so many times. Mark Morrison Reed wrote this. Unitarian Universalists didn't know that Selma was going to become that pivotal moment in our history. In the past, our religious forebears had stood on the brink of making a difference in racial justice and had wavered, but not this time, called, sent, drawn or compelled, hundreds responded. In other words, watching the atrocities that occurred on that bridge five decades ago broke open the heart of Unitarian Universalism, and it was mended with the gold of action. Wholeheartedness is what happens here. I know because it happens to me and because it happens all around me. It is what we do together. It's where we take the gold of right relationship and mend hearts, and it's where, with courage, compassion, and community, we walk through the inevitable storms of life with our chins held high. One form of vulnerability is to walk into a future in which there are no promises of how things will turn out. Together here, though, we hold the space for us to grow together, to offer our many gifts, and to be witness to what theologian Frederick Buchner said. He said, a miracle is what happens 
when the sum is greater, when something is greater than the sum of its parts. And every week we see here that kind of miracle, where something is greater than the sum of its parts. Here we affirm that we create something stronger from the inevitable breakages of life. Not something perfect, but something good enough. Our history tells us that we can be a community of love, the place that says, I'm proud of you, I love you, to one another when we most need it. And then, like Ruby Bridges, we arm ourselves with love and have the courage to walk from this place into the full complexity and catastrophe of our lives and the world. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high because you are known through the eyes of love.